Good morning. I'm Jeff Cowan. I'm the director of the Center for Communication Leadership and Policy at the Annenberg School at USC. And on behalf of the Annenberg School, I'm pleased to welcome you all here today. And I want to thank you all for coming. There's an interesting mixture of people here today. There are some very good stories uh, in the news media already about this report, the New York, New York Times, the Financial Times, the Associated Press, uh, Neiman, uh, Pointer have all done very interesting pieces about, about the story. Uh, and, and today's conversation will both be for the press, but also for uh, academics who are here and people from the uh, affected industries, particularly the newspaper industry, um, and people from the government or government policymakers. And all of those different entities are affected by the conversation we're going to have today. I want to say thank you to a few people and institutions. First of all, to the Carnegie Corporation for supporting the study that we are releasing today. Secondly, to the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and to the dean of that school, uh, Ernest Wilson. A third to USC's Washington office, Jen Gratzky, who did so much work for putting this together, and her terrific team. And our team at the Center for Communication Leadership and Policy, which is led by our managing director, Jeff Baum, and includes uh, Kelsey Brown, who does a wonderful job, and Ariel Fox, who will be part of our presentation today, and uh, David Westfall, who will be making most of the presentation. And also, a lot of our work was done by doctoral students at USC, and their report actually is available on our website, which David will be describing later. Before turning this over to David, I want to say a couple of words about context uh, and background. First of all, the USC Annenberg School has been deeply interested and involved in questions of how the digital revolution is changing journalism for a great many years. Many of you are probably familiar with the Online Journalism Review, which we started in 1998 and remains an important force in thinking about those changes. And we've been doing a tremendous amount of training of journalists to be ready for this new revolution, and many of the people now leading it uh, are, are our graduates. Um, and today, innovations in this area are being led by the new dean, Ernest Wilson, and by Geneva Overholzer, who many of you know, who's a terrific journalist and is now running our journalism school and has brought on some very, very exciting people uh, to lead the way in thinking about that area. Our Center on Communication Leadership and Policy has been thinking about issues of media and democracy uh, and one of our main areas is looking at what might be thought of as new business models for news. And we've been focusing on three areas. One is innovations taking advantage of new technology. And we've done a lot of work in that area. The second is the role of philanthropy. And we've done quite a bit of work in that area. And we have reports in all of these areas uh, as well as we think innovations available. Um, and the third is to look at the role of government uh, in journalism. As we've looked at the role of government, one of the things that has astonished uh, David uh, Westfall and me is that as, as the news media are in crisis, and we're concerned about the crisis in the news media not because we're trying to protect an industry or an industry that's dying, because, but because we think that a vibrant and outstanding uh, journalistic world is essential to a democracy, and that includes reporters being based all over the world, it includes investigative reporting, it includes local community reporting, we think it's essential to have a terrific news core everywhere and have their information distributed widely. Uh, what we've noticed is that as report after report has come out with suggestions about changes that should be taken or initiatives that should be taken, they usually mention something should be done by the government, state uh, governments, federal government, local government. And when those proposals are made, they are almost inevitably attacked by some commentators, editorial writers, uh, some academics and others, who say, oh no, heaven forbid, the sky is falling, the government should never be involved with the news media. And David and I were struck by that because our understanding was that in fact, the government, starting with the federal government, has always been deeply involved in supporting the news media, and deliberately so, starting with uh, George Washington and James Madison. And we think they were right. Others may differ. But what our report seeks to document is the extent to which in several of the, and we don't even list nearly all the areas, but we talk uh, in some depth about three areas in which the government has been involved in funding the commercial news media from the start and remains deeply involved today. 
The notion that there is some kind of a state press wall, like the state church wall, has never been true and isn't true today, to use a phrase that David has coined. There is no state press wall, and there hasn't been, and we don't think there should be. But if people think there should be, let's have a fair and honest discussion of it and talk about all of the support that's currently going on. The second thing that David and I found, and which we'll be talking about, is that a bit counterintuitively, the amount of support at, the, at every level uh, of, for the news media by the government is declining and declining sharply. The fact is that uh, news media does not get nearly the level of support that it used to from the government, and it's almost inevitably going to de decline further and uh, de decline sharply uh, if new steps aren't taken. That could be a decision that as a society we decide to make, but it's one that we should make with our eyes open, knowing what's going on. And so with that background, I'm thrilled to uh, ask to come to the podium David Westfall, who was the uh, bureau chief for McClatchy here for many years, the managing editor of the, uh, um, of the um, Des Moines Register, uh, and now a, a member of our team at USC. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. It's uh, good, to be, good to be back in Washington and to be uh, talking about a subject that I'll admit has been somewhat of a surprise to me in, in its uh, specific findings. Um, I've, I spent uh, most of four decades in, in newspapering, the last half of that um, right here in Washington, and I, I was really unaware, frankly, of how much money the government was spending on the news business. Um, I was surprised to find, for example, that the government is providing roughly 40% uh, of public broadcasting's budget. But I was even more surprised um, and kind of taken aback to find out how much tax money uh, goes to support the commercial news business. Um, and, and as Jeff said, uh, uh, that a great deal of that assistance is likely to go, go away or indeed already has gone away. I don't know if you will be uh, as surprised as I was about these issues, but I would suggest that there may be a disconnect here or a kind of mythology that's getting in the way of an informed debate about the government's role now in the news re revolution. And so we believe it's very important to get some fundamentals straight. And we begin with a simple fact, and that is that there has never been a time when American government wasn't supporting the commercial press. Our, our report uh, focuses on three kinds of support for uh, publishers in particular, postal subsidies, paid public notices, and federal and state tax breaks. Um, but of course, and I should note at the outset that uh, in, in many, many ways, big and small, state, local, uh, and federal governments have provided many more kinds of financial assistance for the news business. Uh, such as free licenses for broadcast owners, ultimately uh, worth billions of dollars, free or very low-priced access to city sidewalks for newspaper vendor boxes, or uh, the government investments that uh, created the satellites that make the news and information world go around today. It's important to note we're not saying here that American governments back the commercial news industry the same, uh, the same way that some governments do. For example, France and its uh, new program of uh, giving free subscriptions uh, to people uh, when they reach age, age 18, or Sweden and its uh, direct cash payment to newspapers. But neither is it true that American government assistance amounts to peanuts, or as many people believe, is simply non-existent. In addition to the $1 billion plus that governments, uh, that governments, state, local, and federal governments in the United States put into public broadcasting every year, it's investing more than that in the support of commercial news businesses. So let's look at these three ways that support for, commercial, uh, for the commercial news industry plays out, postal subsidies, paid public notices, and tax breaks. And 
<clears throat> the first two uh, have been, in fact, around well before, since well before uh, the Revolutionary War. Scholars have argued, in fact, that it's precisely because of postal subsidies that newspapers were able to develop in the United States. Postmasters assigned very low rates to newspaper mailings in colonial days, and many allowed the free exchange uh, through the mails between two newspapers. This laid the framework then for high postal subsidies for newspapers and magazines. And as Jeff said, this was the policy championed by Washington and Madison, then codified in the Postal Act of 1792, which was one of the first acts of Congress. And it's a structure that would remain in place for more than 250 years. Publishers' bottom lines have been the rich beneficiaries. There's quite a similar story for paid public notices, an idea incorporated from old Europe that over time was picked up by every level of government. And it is true that public notices have been an extremely powerful force throughout American history in setting a standard for openness. Uh, and I think you can draw a direct uh, line between paid public notices and uh, the kind of sunshine laws that we have today that ensure open documents, open records, open meetings that uh, give American citizens uh, the access they need to, to, uh, to operate this democracy. Public notices today are required for myriad activities, municipal zoning changes, school district budgets, bankruptcy notices, seized property actions, and the like. Governments impose these requirements on themselves, on subordinate governments, and on the private sector. The result for newspapers is the same in every case, a very good revenue source. This is a business that's been especially lucrative for community newspapers. Their National Trade Association, the National uh, Newspaper Association, estimated in the uh, year 2000 that it represent that paid public notices represented 5 to 10 percent of all revenue. So it's 5, five to 10 percent for a community newspaper. But it's not just small newspapers that benefit. Virtually all newspapers get to play, including, as you may have seen this morning, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Journal today had, uh, I think, four or four and a half pages of uh, paid public notices. It's the kind of thing that uh, sometimes you just read over, but, or can't read, <laughs> because it's often pretty small print. Um, and uh, and this is, uh, this is a, a healthy run, but it's not uh, out of the norm. Uh, we conducted a study of the journal and found that in terms of column inches, it was uh, government-mandated public notices that consumed the largest share of advertising space in, in the paper. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not just the journal either. This is the classified section of the post this morning. And, and uh, it's, you know, m maybe the only way that the bad economy has been good for newspapers is page after p page of uh, foreclosure notices uh, uh, in the post this morning. <clears throat> So, and, and uh, I might add, too, that the, the journal um, uh, has been in court in Virginia uh, throughout 2009, 2009 trying to expand its share of the public notice market. So if you look at the cumulative effect of, of these two categories and then you add in tax breaks at the state and federal level, here's what you see. By the late 1960s, postal subsidies were worth nearly two, $2 billion dollars uh, expressed in today's dollars. Public notices at that time brought in and still bring in hundreds of millions in revenue. Um, we're not aware that anyone has uh, really figured out how much magazines, uh, excuse me, how much revenue nationally is present uh, in, in the public notice market. But in Iowa, the Newspaper Association uh, uh, recently estimated that it, it amounted to one twentieth of one percent of all local government spending, which sounds like not much, but if you would extrapolate that out nationally, it's more than $800 million annually. And that's just for uh, local jurisdictions. 
uh, and it doesn't count state and federal. So it would not be surprising to see a 10-figure number here as well. And finally, state and federal tax breaks today are worth almost $1 billion in revenue lost to the government. They include everything from federal tax breaks uh, on unsold magazines and circulation expenses to sales tax exemptions on the purchase of news, uh, newsprint and ink. And I will add that that $1 billion figure uh, is mainly state tax, tax break money, and that's based on our research uh, of 37 states, uh, which were the only states that actually reported the, uh, this data. 13 states didn't report at all, and so uh, it, it, we don't know how much, but it wouldn't be, again, surprising to see the figure go um, substantially above $1 billion. So if you had been able to add all this up in the late 1960s and you converted it to today's dollars, you'd be talking government assistance of one kind or another that probably was in the $4 billion range. That's a small but significant chunk of the news industry's business. And that's the first key finding of this report. Government backing for the commercial press has always been with us, and it adds up to some big bucks. Here's a second finding. This support is in the midst of long-term decline that is destined to continue unless policymakers take a new tack. That story of decline has already played out on postal subsidies. Prior to 1970, 75% of the cost of mailing newspapers and magazines is borne by the Postal Service. But beginning with the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 and continuing today, that level of subsidy has been in almost constant, de constant decline and now stands at just 11%. In today's dollars, that's a reduction from about $2 billion to not quite $300 million. And almost all of it today goes for magazines. If you look at the fact that the Postal Service for uh, the year two, uh, 2010 is anticipating a deficit of $7 billion, you can see that the future here is not especially bright. Now, federal and state tax breaks appear not in quite as much danger, but they too are likely to fall. As I indicated, some of the tax breaks are tied to old, old technology, such as sales tax on the purchase of newsprint and ink. And of course, governments are under great pressure in any case to reduce costs. That is a d dynamic at play as well in public notices, which are quite likely to go the way of postal subsidies, meaning their revenue will be cut way back. Legislation has been in introduced in 40 states to, re uh, to move public notices to the web. So far, most of these initiatives have failed, and public uh, notices largely remain in, in the printed uh, newspaper. Indeed, there are many good reasons why right now that uh, they should remain, including the reality that they'll be seen by more people, in most cases, if they're published than if they're simply posted on a government website. But this shift has begun, and, and we think it's inevitable that it will grow, and probably means the large uh, majority, perhaps the overwhelming majority, of this profitable business will go away. And for many newspapers, this would be a really crushing loss. It will be an especially interesting arena to watch uh, now over the next few months as the legislative season uh, gets underway. For example, last week, both uh, uh, committees in both the Iowa House and Iowa Senate passed bills that would allow local jurisdiction to move all of their public notices out of, the, out of uh, newspapers onto uh, their own government websites. <clears throat> so, um, all, all of this kind of raises a question, is this what the government really wants to do, to reduce funding for the news business right now? These declines have not been happening because uh, anyone has got it out for the news industry. They've resulted really from technology uh, advances and government spending concerns. So shouldn't new forms of government assistance be considered at this critical moment for the news industry. In this report, we make uh, no specific recommendations about new policy initiatives, though we note the many suggestions that have been uh, put on the table, I ideas like a, a WPA-type program for un unemployed writers, 
uh, tax law changes that could allow newspapers to become nonprofits, tax write-offs for citizens uh, uh, on their news subscriptions. There are many more, and you can find a good sampling uh, of them on the website uh, that encapsulates this report, and we'll, uh, we'll note more about that later. We do offer a couple of additional thoughts, though, based on our research of some other areas to consider uh, and also a, suggest, a suggested framework for how policy makers might think about the future. So a couple things to consider. First, expand public broadcasting. We were struck by two data points in our research. One, among news media, public broadcasting has by far the highest levels of uh, uh, support in terms of trust uh, uh, among American citizens. This is interesting too, right, because it, it really calls into the question the notion that you can't have a subsidized press because Americans won't trust it to report on the government. Public broadcasting shows uh, that it can get significant government support and still have the trust of Americans, much higher than the commercial press. And the second data point with, with respect to uh, public broadcasting is that compared to international norms, of course, public broadcasting in the United States is significantly underfunded. On a per capita basis, Great Britain spends 60 times more than the United States does on public broadcasting. So if our news environment needs significant strengthening, a pretty obvious remedy is at hand in public broadcasting. Also, it may be time to change the laws that prohibit domestic dissemination of news broadcasts done by the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and other international broadcasting services of the United States. A 1949 law prohibits these newscasts from being rebroadcast to domestic audiences. But, of course, the Internet is in the process of making this prohibition uh, a meaningless relic. And taking this law off the books could help bring these terrific news services more richly into the American news environment. Finally, our report offers a possible framework for how policymakers might look at the future. First, do no harm. We're in the midst of a tremendous cycle of digital news creation. And there is a danger, of course, of squelching it. Second, focus on innovation. Satellite uh, technology, creation of the internet, are both powerful examples of how the government has powerfully influenced the news business. And this may well be what the government does best. Finally, if subsidies are an answer, they should be based on formulas as opposed to schemes in which the government picks winners and losers. Ultimately, as Jeff suggested, we, we hope this report helps put to rest uh, a myth that we believe exists about the relationship be between the news business and government. It just is not true that the commercial press has been walled off from government's assistance in some sort of church-state separation. We don't suggest that government assistance is therefore the only logical answer to what's going on now in the, in the uh, news revolution. Our report details some powerful forces of innovation and creation underway and observes that it is indeed possible that the new information economy make, make significant government action un unnecessary. But a different outcome is also possible, one that at least in the short run could leave the citizen, citizenry of the country without the information it needs to govern this democracy. Government assistance of some sort may therefore be prudent. And as our report suggests, government support would be perfectly in sync with American history. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take questions now. I, 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 as I said, I wanted to, uh, wanted to urge you uh, later to look at the uh, website, findingthenews.org. Uh, it has not only this report, but also the much more detailed reports done by uh, researchers whose work was fundamental to this project. Uh, Ariel Fox, who's here with us today, as well as Sean Powers, Rahul, Neela Kantan, and um, Matthew Weber. And, and in addition to the topics that we discussed today, such as tax policy, postal sub subsidies, public notices, and so on, 
There are papers discussing intellectual property issues, antitrust issues, uh, broadband expansion uh, uh, on the website that I think you'll find illuminating. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to invite any questions for um, Jeff, Cowan, or me, and also uh, Ariel Fox. I know we have a, not just press, but policymakers here, so I think we can think of this as a discussion as well as a, uh, a question and answer session. So if people have ideas that they want to discuss, let's do it. Uh, Jeff, Chris, are there mics in the audience? Yeah, so we have a wireless mic, too, if anybody wants to make an observation or, or ask a question. That would be a discussion. And if you could identify yourself, that would be great. Okay. I'm Susan DeSanti. I'm a director of policy planning at the Federal Trade Commission, and we're working on a project on the future of news, and we were fortunate enough to have David Westfall on one of the panels at, at a workshop that we had in December. And my question is, um, really, in this time when there is so much public rejection of quote-unquote bailouts, have you thought about how this could be framed. I mean, I think it's very helpful to have the history as part of the framing, but how could, could this be framed so that it's not perceived as yet another bailout, this time of the newspaper industry? I think one of the things that we're proposing is investments in innovation. And an example of that that I was talking with, uh, I don't think he's still here, but a representative of the FCC about has to do with broadband. So the federal government is actually putting $3 billion into broadband enhancement, and part of the reason for that is to reach rural audiences or audiences that have not previously had the full advantage of broadband. One thing that we know happens is, bless you, and bless the FTC, but, <laughs> but one thing that we know happens is that as, the, uh, as broadband is increased, people go migrate, from print media or even broadcast media to those new media. That's inevitable, and that's part of what you're hoping is going to happen. That then further drains resources from the older media, including the ones that we've talked about here and others, but the argument becomes weaker for, uh, for keeping the public notice requirements and many other things in those newspapers. And yet those newspapers often don't have the resources to uh, to really take advantage of the new opportunities created by the web. So one of the things that we think could be interesting is to think about an investment fund for, uh, for enterprises that were part of the old media and need to take advantage of the new media environment. That would just be one kind of example that uh, isn't a continuing support uh, of an industry, but helps the industry reach into a new era. David, do you want to add anything? I guess one other thought there. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I said at the outset, I was a little surprised, uh, maybe more than a little surprised, at how much money uh, we're talking about on, on, on all fronts, really, um, public broadcasting and, uh, and money put into the commercial news business. And I, so I've kind of been wondering about why didn't I understand this better and why, didn't, why wasn't I aware of it? I mean, this is the business I've been in. <laughs> um, and I, I think... Um, that it's an interesting question to raise and you know, wonder whether um, there couldn't be a richer discussion of this uh, from, from many pr participants in, in a kind of more straightforward way about the, the, um, the historic relationship between the uh, government and the press. I'd like, I'd like to see you know, everyone, uh, whether it be academics or the media or politicians or whatever, talk, talk about this in, in, in ways that re really reflect our, our uh, heritage and kind of our values at the founding of the con country. Good morning. I'm Tish King from the Broadcasting Board of Governors. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Broadcasting Board of Governors, that includes the Voice of America, which you mentioned today. And we have a long tradition of news which is balanced and unbiased in the same family as public broadcasting or the great tradition of McClatchy. And we know, I think, all of us here are familiar that there are shifts in domestic media becoming increasingly partisan or representative of one perspective or another. 
So I'm interested in your assessment of these proposals. To what extent would they be available to all comers? Or would it be, um, you know, if you're you know, advancing the model of public broadcasting, I don't know how it would all shake out. If you took the example of tax breaks that are deliberately in the law, and anybody who wants, we can give you uh, legislative examples of them, if anybody wants details here, but, or um, uh, not so much public notices, but subsidy, postal subsidies, they exist for partisan organizations as much as for nonpartisan. So the National Review and the Nation are beneficiaries of postal subsidies, uh, if you think of them as partisan, uh, as much as Time Magazine is. So, and I think what we're proposing is that the government shouldn't be in the position of picking and choosing in that way. We'd love to see systems that actually apply to everybody, whether they be partisan or whether they be nonpartisan, because we think that actually, if you go back again to the founder's idea, com uh, common sense was a very partisan document, but that's what they had in mind. The papers of the founding of the public actually were very partisan papers, but they were informing the public. And I think that to somehow only support those things which somebody determines to be balanced is probably anti-historical also. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Craig Aaron. I'm with Free Press. And, uh, you know, I'm interested, you guys didn't come down for any specific policies, but certainly in the range of policies, it's going to take some kind of political will uh, to uh, make any of these changes to reverse this slide. And, and I guess I'm interested to hear your take on what the role of working journalists themselves should be in that effort. So many journalists have been conditioned that they have no role to play, that they shouldn't take stands on public policy issues, that that violates what they're doing. Now, their bosses have not been held to those same restrictions here in town, but the journalists have. So what is their role in advancing wh whichever policies emerge as, as maybe the best solutions and the ones you've looked at? What, what do you see their role being? Well, of course, today, working journalists uh, is, a, is a broader and broader uh, topic in some ways, um, but um, maybe fewer in number in terms of uh, people getting paid. But, um, but uh, working journalists uh, today um, uh, have, have uh, lives that are not attached, for example, to a mainstream or news organization. So, I mean, you're talking about a very diverse group of people, and, and there is some conversation, I think, uh, among working journalists about this. I, I would, I, I suppose the other thing I would say is that, you know, uh, news coverage wells up from uh, working journalists at, at a news organization. This, this is a topic worthy of coverage, and uh, it, and it, it, it would not, uh, it, it's difficult, of course, for the news industry to sort of cover itself. It's always fraught in all kinds of ways, but the worst thing that can be done, I think, is to not play is to say, well, we can't, we don't really, nobody's gonna believe us, and so we, we can't talk about, we can't talk about this. Um, n newspapers certainly are talking about public notices, for example, and they editorialize against the removal of public notices uh, from their newspapers. The richer, the richer issues here, I think, are worthy of coverage, and I think working, <coughs> working journalists at mainstream news organizations can, can say, I wanna, I, I wanna do a story about this. Um, I want to underline the good work that your group does, and in fact, uh, but you know, as do, does the Knight Commission that's represented here and others, that when you propose government solutions, many working journalists think that that's anti-historical. They think that to do so somehow violates what David calls this uh, press state wall, which not only doesn't exist, but as we point out in the report, uh, the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting freedom of religion, but it says no law abridging freedom of speech in the press, and that's always taken to mean that the Congress can make laws enhancing freedom of the press. And that's been true, as we say, since the founders. I think part of what we need to do is to educate our own brethren in the journalistic world to the fact that this has always been there. Um, I want to come back for one second to Susan's question because I want to throw a couple of other ideas on the table, if I could. Um, one is that not all of the money that uh, is, goes into uh, journalism 
uh, comes from the government. For better or for worse, but to be honest, we should understand it. Those foreclosure notices that David pointed to that constitute almost the entire classified section of this morning's Washington Post, and I would get, bet that working, probably no working journalist in the city bothers to read this. There are no bicycle ads here in this. These are, there's no job wanted ads. These are all foreclosure notices. And who's paying for the foreclosure notices? It's not being paid for by the government. Now, the Wall Street Journal pages that we showed you are paid for by the federal government. They're actually Department of Justice ads and so forth. But, what, but and to some extent, they're directed by the government. But a lot of them are actually placed by the government with their own funds. Uh, we talk a little bit about drug advertising, pharmaceutical advertising. Uh, we all see those pharmaceutical ads on television which tell us about all the counterindications that make you think, why in the world would anybody ever take this medication? Um, but if you look at those ads, at the end of them they say, um, please see our full ad in Red Book or in US News and World Report. That isn't accidental. That's because the Food and Drug Administration requires it. If you're going to have a television ad, you also have a, have a print ad. And the, those print ads are like three pages of print that's, if anything, smaller than the stuff in, in the uh, Wall Street Journal of these classified ads. Um, but it's required. I, I'm not for the moment arguing whether that's a bad or good thing. Those are government regulations which help the press and which are uh, actually paid for privately. The other idea I want to throw out is this. We, we, another thing that has always been in the Constitution, it was something the founders argued for, was copyright protection. There's no protection for making a car. Well, there's patents for the go into it and so forth. But there's copyright protection specifically in, uh, in order to protect and encourage the development of, of ideas and of, and of literature and so forth. Um, again, a founder idea having to do with the First Amendment. We think that we can be more creative about the use of copyright protections. We're not sure if these are good ideas or not. But one concept might be something that was once called a hot news protection, which would say that uh, news stories themselves, and maybe even the information in a news story that was broken by a news organization, be protected for some short period of time. Maybe it's three hours in today's world. And if that were true, um, then what might happen, and this is the kind of thing you'd want to explore, is that it would increase the ability of those people who are gathering news, the Associated Press or, um, uh, or the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, to negotiate with Huffington Posts and with Googles and so forth to get more fees for using their information for during that period of time. But there could be creative ideas in the intellectual property field. We know that in the music field, for all of the failures of the music field, there have been some successes in terms of the public uses of, of music. And there have to be ways of finding creative solutions here, which again don't require the government to pay any government money for a bailout, but assure that people are actually compensated for the investment that they're making in developing the news. Hi, Jim Barnett with AARP, and I'm also a volunteer blogger for the Neiman Lab. Uh, I, you all are probably familiar with the Cardin Bill, which was introduced last, I think, last uh, spring, which would really single out newspapers as a medium to help them uh, ease the transition to nonprofit status. Two questions about it. One, does that meet the test for policies that you're talking about here? And is it possible to structure a, uh, a tax break for nonprofits that preserves the, the process and the product of journalism without being targeted to a particular type of medium, whether print or digital? Earl, do you want to talk about that? I'm sorry. The Cardin Bill. Yeah. Um, well, the, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I kind of thought the Cardin Bill might get some traction. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have so far, but the, but the essence of that would be uh, to allow n newspapers to um, convert from for-profit to non-profit operation, make them eligible for uh, charitable contributions that can be, you know, a, a tax deduction for contributors. 
um, there's one version of, the, of it that would uh, exempt from taxation um, advertising that they s sold. So that's an, kind of an interesting idea, and I, I think is in, in some ways uh, consistent. It doesn't, it doesn't meet the test of, of fairness for everybody. It doesn't address broadcast, or it doesn't address other, uh, other um, mediums. There's, a, there's also an issue there, of course, um, with respect to uh, the IRS not, uh, under current law anyway, probably not allowing uh, political endorsements um, in, in the way it doesn't allow uh, uh, political endorsements for publica uh, publications, nonprofits now that are um, tax-exempt tax nonprofits. Uh, I'm not sure there's a way around that, that under current law, uh, although some people have suggested there might be. Uh, actually, there was a fairly recent paper that, that thought that, that speculated that there might be a way for a newspaper to convert with nonprofit status without the legislation, which is sort of sort of interesting. But I but I, I think it's um, it's an interesting idea, and I again I am a little surprised it hasn't gotten a, a bit more traction. There are some there are there are some financial issues related to uh, a newspaper making that tra uh, transition that may be uh, in some ways a bigger stumbling block than even the politi political action on it. I just want to add a, a, a word or two about it. I've been on the, that so-called working group of the, of the Cardin uh, group. And, and I, my view, and it's not the view of everybody in the working group, uh, I think that the restrictions on, on speech are much more limited. That is, I think much more speech is allowed for nonprofits than some assume. And if you consider the nonprofits that are out there, like The Nation or, again, The New Republic and so forth, people, Mother Jones, people don't usually think of them as inhibited. Uh, and I'm not sure they think of the Neiman reports as being inhibited either. Uh, the restrictions are fairly mild. There are restrictions on endorsing candidates. Probably those restrictions may actually have been impacted by the Citizens United case. None of us know the full implications of the Supreme Court decision last week. But it may be that they will remove that restriction even on nonprofits of this kind and, and even on foundations. We just don't know where that's going to lead us. Um, but I think it's the kind of creative thinking that's necessary. And it's the kind of creative thinking that we're encouraging. It may be that bankruptcy law should be explored. I mean, right now, uh, we think it was a terrible mistake, or I'll just speak for myself. It's not a part of our report. I think that what happened with the amount of investment that was made, that the Sam Zell purchase of the LA Times, and the Tribune Company, I should say, was, was a huge mistake for a lot of reasons when it happened. And it was a mistake that was made by private entities. But he took on $13 billion of debt with no cash involvement. Incredible. So the amount of money that he had to make, that his newspapers had to make before they could even break even, was close to a billion dollars. In this economy, that was impossible. So they're now in bankruptcy. But, the, but in bankruptcy, and of course, since they're in bankruptcy, they don't actually have to pay profit to anybody. I believe that we were, to, Dave and I were told recently that every publication of the Tribune group was making money. Now, that's making money without that $13 billion in debt. I don't know if there's any way in which the law could allow those publications or others that are in bankruptcy to, to get rid of the debt. But probably no single thing is so damaging to newspapers today as the incredible and very mistaken debt burdens they took on. And I simply don't have any idea whether there's a way in which the government could help to remove those debts. I think if it was done, it shouldn't be done in a way that favored anybody who had taken on the debts. But after all, if you allowed the debts to all be taken off the books, everybody, there'd be a lot of people damaged by it. But there, the news media might thrive because of it. So I think there may be a lot of creative solutions out there that require a lot of thought but it should all go forward, and this is our bottom line. I know this is the last question. Do it in an honest way. Don't pretend that the founders would have turned over in their graves. The fact is the founders believed in the government playing this kind of role. The kind of debate and discussion initiatives that we're talking about here are the things the founders would have wanted us to do, things that the Constitution calls for us to do. It's the kind of thing we should engage in. If we come up with great ideas, terrific. If there are no good ideas, fine. But just don't hide behind the idea of a church, of a, of a state 
uh, press separation that never has existed, doesn't exist today, and would, at the moment, if it did exist, be just one more crippling blow to the press. Thank you all very much for coming. And just, just speaking to that, that the question, too, we're going from here to Capitol Hill to brief uh, legislators and legislative staff about the report. Uh, the, the find, the more copies of the report are available in the back, and if anybody would like copies of the PowerPoint or any other materials, just leave your card at the front desk. Thank you.